Well, hello there. I'm Susan Radojevic, and this is Corner Office. Complexity. What is it? What does it mean? What do we do with it? Is it bad? Is it good? Do we care? Should we care? Recently, HBR featured it. Last year, IBM conducted a global CEO study on complexity. Over 1,500 CEOs interviewed landed on three shared perspectives. First, the rapid escalation of complexity is the biggest challenge facing CEOs. Next, enterprises today are not equipped to cope effectively with complexity in the global environment. And finally, CEOs identified creativity as the single most important leadership competency for organizations in order to navigate through complexity. According to the IBM survey, we care. And to provide some insight and practical compelling ideas on this topic that's gripped our brain waves, I am joined by three innovative thinkers. First, our very own Corner Office Explorer, Deborah Prickfield, is principal and think master of ThinkSpot Burlington. Deborah's work is in collaboration, and she says effective collaboration is messy. Next, Jean Le Tourneau is CEO of SBVCG Inc. and a former, uh, sorry, and a present Corner Office Explorer. Jean's focus is on unlocking end-to-end -end business value and making things simple. And joining us via Skype from across the pond in the UK is our special guest and award winner, David Snowden. David is founder and chief scientific officer of Cognitive Edge. David's work is in complexity, in complex adaptive systems. Nice to have you all in corner office. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, nice to be here. Now, just before we wrap our brain cells around complexity, as a friend of mine would say, we invite you, our online community and in-house audience, to share your thoughts. After all, Corner Office is an intersection where c conversations take place before, during, and after the show. So, if you are watching us online and have a question, please use the chat tab found on your screen. If, a, if you are following us on our Twitter hashtag, CEOLive, post your questions using the hashtag. Maria, our community manager, is monitoring our channels and will make sure we get your questions. And for our in-house audience, we have a microphone you can use. Okay, with our engagement channels open, let's get started, shall we? Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Preparing for this show, we found different things mean different things to people. So we found that complexity mean, meant different things to the people that we spoke with and also uh, researched. So I want to start off by asking the three of you, what does complexity mean to you? And I want to start with David. David? Okay. Um. I think there's a common language sense of the world which gets confused with chaotic and confused and other C words. Complexity for me represents a system where the constraints on the system, the constraints on behavior are partial and can be modified by the way that people interact with those constraints. So effectively the constraints and people's actions co-evolve which makes for inherent uncertainty. So I would want to go with the scientific definition of the word complexity because I think that's where we can get the most traction going forwards because it leads to a whole body of theory we can draw on and devise and inventions. Okay, so it's a scientific, David's looking at it from a scientific perspective. Jean? <coughs> I'm looking at uh, complexity after listening to David from uh, how organizations feel when they are uh, experimenting complexity so it's feeling like uh, having headwind and uh, playing a lot of guessing game and uh, having a lot of constraint in doing things so complexity is a kind of paralyzing organizations from moving 
and moving quicker and moving more uh, smarter. Okay. Deborah? Mm -hmm. So when I look at it, I think for me, complexity is the fact you have no idea what the outcome is going to be. And so it, with that entails a lot of risk. And that's when people get scared and then they try and default back to what they think it should be. So the complexity arises in how the humans, how we all engage with each other and interact and that's what I care about. So we've got a scientific uh, approach to it with some practical um, application from David. We've got practical and um, reducing the confusion of what it can represent. And we have an emotional intelligence around yeah, it. Is exactly. that what we're saying? Yep. Okay, great. Oh, wow, it's going to make for a great conversation, I think. <laughs> okay, so let, let me ask each of you, and I'm going to start with David again, is we have different perspectives, and now we have also, we're prone to, as people, just to believe things that may not always be true. So sometimes we believe myths. So what is a myth? that is getting in the way of us dealing with complexity more effectively, David? Just starting with me again, okay. Yeah. Um, the main one is the myth that human beings are rational actors and that you can predict the future if it's inherently complex. So if you look at some of the work I've been doing recently with American Armed Forces, we've been talking about systems which aren't causal. Either they have no cause and effect, but they have dispositions. So they might evolve in some directions, they might evolve in others, but you won't know until they actually do it. So the two main myths are the myths that human beings make rational decisions, they don't. Actually myths act as an agent in a human system, they can strange behavior. The other is that the future is inherently knowable if you do enough analysis or design. The key thing to understand about a complex adaptive system is you only understand it by acting in it and with high sensitivity to small changes. Okay. So, Deborah? Yeah, the myth for me would be the fact that we think we actually can't live in a complex world. And, and so we fear it, and so we try and avoid it and seek certainty. And by then we stop innovating because why risk? Why, you know, why risk a million dollars on a project if we can't actually know what the outcome is going to be? So, to me, the myth is we actually can live with that uncertainty and the complexity and actually do quite well. So we hide behind the myth, is what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Why risk? Why risk anything? Okay. Jean? Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, one of the myths is that uh, dealing with complexity could uh, cost a lot of money to organizations. And uh, a lot of companies are too busy uh, making their numbers for the next quarter and the next quarter, and there are too much things to do than to deal with uh, the complexity itself. And if they would have to deal with that, that would cost them too much money, and then we don't have the time to do that. And uh, I kind of agree a lot with uh, David when he says that sometimes, you know, very simple things could be done that could have a dramatic impact on the organization, but people are too busy. They are too busy to look at those simple things that can make a big difference. So we need to recognize that complexity is not a bad thing. Right? We, we, we see it as a yeah, good we, thing. Yeah, we need to embrace it because okay. that is, it's just a new, it's the new reality. So if we run from it, then, we, then we're just, as you said, hiding behind it. And, and if we're afraid of it, then we don't think that maybe it can be simple. And, uh, and that's really going to be the only thing that's going to innovate our way out of where we are in the world okay. is, is how we're going to approach it. Okay, I'm going to do a very quick poll here, and since we have an in-house audience, I'm going to start with them. And Maria, I'm also, let's reach out to the community, so if, uh, when people are watching us, I'd like to, them to participate as well. So, I want to ask, in your opinion, how do you see complexity? Is it an opportunity? Do you see it as an opportunity? Just raise your hands. Opportunity? Opportunity. Okay, so nobody sees it as a challenge. It's both? It's both. Well, which one is it more, an opportunity or more of a challenge? And what, which, is it represent, does it represent opportunity? Maybe I should rephrase that. Does it represent opportunity or does it represent challenge? It might depend uh, if you are working with RIM. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> you know, complexity could be a challenge these days. If you work for Apple, uh, uh, complexity could be an opportunity. So 
you know, it depends on what uh, side of the borders you stand and maybe some companies you work with, you know, it's, uh, it's all about opportunity. How do you see it? How do you see it? How, what does complexity represent to you, an opportunity or, or a challenge? I tend to be on the optimist, optimi optimi optimistic? Sorry, optimistic <laughs> side, thank <laughs> you very yeah. much. So I always see it as an opportunity. opportunity? Yeah. David, is it an do you, does it represent an opportunity or a challenge? Both. Both? Okay. Yeah, I was going to say it's absolutely both. Okay. Yeah. Well, the survey conducted by IBM, as I mentioned to you earlier, out of over 1,500 of the CEOs saw it as their biggest challenge. So the question becomes, how do we make it into more of an opportunity and less of a challenge? Because if it's a challenge, we, we're holding ourselves back from taking that risk. So how do we shift our thinking to make it more of an opportunity? Who wants okay. to take that one? I'll go for it. Okay. Um, about two-thirds, Daniel Goleman um, on emotional intelligence talks about the fact that about two-thirds of a company's or an organization's performance is impacted by the emotional engagement. And so if we could actually start learning those skills about how we can go through these risky things and not A, blame me for screwing up, or you know, saying, well, I would never have done that, but it's learning how to accept, not that it's a failure, that it was just like, oh, now what do we do with this? What's the experiment, as we call it, or, the, or we're exploring. So I think if we could actually start to embrace that more, and it's, it has to be from the top down, that would help us in, in, in changing that mindset. Okay. David? I think they have to start, and I don't think IBM will help them much with this, by the way. Um, <laughs> IBM is one of the most complicated companies I know. Uh, it makes the US government feel like it's positively dynamic and non bureaucratic. <laughs> and, you know, we, we won't go there, right? It's seven years. Yeah. I've never forgotten it. Um, I think the key thing is for executives to realize that um, fundamentally the, big, the changes they need to make are comparable with the big changes made in the 1980s around business process re-engineering. Um, that was driven by systems thinking and resulted in major change, some good, some bad. It's been carried to excess at the moment with things like Six Sigma, or as I call it, Six Stigma. Um, I think what they need to start to realize is a different way of thinking. That means a few basic things. They need to start to move to a much more engaged form of strategy. At the moment, the process is terribly linear and assumes that the future is predictable and controllable. Certainly, the work we do it around the Canavian framework says if the situation is complex, you construct 10 to 15 different strategic parallel experiments, all of which are safe to fail, all of which are activated very quickly, and you monitor the results and you allow contradictory or contradicting theories to drive those experiments. So I think there's a few very simple rules about the changes you need to make. Just like there were very simple rules in the 80s when we went from functional vertical to horizontal process type changes. And they'll carry some of the pain and some of the executives who, you know, became most comfortable in the process era won't survive in a complexity area just like Taylorism didn't actually achieve the same conversion over to systems thinking. Um, ironically, I actually think governments may be in a better position to do it because they can control larger populations um, with higher levels of interaction. So I think there's actually a huge hope for government here, um, particularly to avoid industrial best practice. Um, in the industry succeeds by allowing mass failure. It's very Darwinian. Governments can't afford to fail. And governments have a different level of social responsibility. Complexity actually offers a huge amount for government management and for whole of citizen engagement and decision making. And that's supported by a whole bod mod bunch of modern technology. So some of us actually call this the new simplicity. Um, the trouble is it's very simple when you get the concept, but it sounds really scary until you actually change the way you think. So it's about changing the way we think, Sean. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> not just the way you think, but the way you uh, do your work. Like uh, Deborah was saying, it's allowing for people to uh, experiment, to uh, succeed or to fail. <coughs> it's, uh, it's about learning how to experiment because a lot of people are not used to do that in their work. Mm -hmm. And they fear to experiment because they fear of the consequences on their annual evaluation. Yep. So if you don't fail uh, and if it's expected from you that you can fail and if you fail this is good, then you're all good. But if you feel that you might uh, 
hurt your uh, performance or your next promotion, then you know you're kind of working against the forces there. And that's why I love David's expression. It's a safe fail, right? You just know that it's inherent that you can actually not have it, because it's a learning. Whatever you do is going to be a learning from it. So I like the expression safe fail. I've actually adopted it quite often now. I'm actually surprised that David said, David, you're saying that the governments are more apt to be able to adapt complexity because I always think that they're so careful. <laughs> out of reach, <laughs> out of reach. <laughs> but I, I, I really, I'm surprised you said that, and I want to piggyback on that in a second because we are going to first ask Maria, how do our virtual audience feel about complexity? Do, does it represent an opportunity, or does it represent a um, challenge for them? What do you, what are they saying, Maria? Um, getting answers for for both. We have a microphone there. Yeah, go ahead. I'm getting answers for both, but nobody's really drilling down like, like you have, so I think it's good that everybody's learning a little bit from these discussions. That's great. Okay, we're going to continue. We're going to take a quick break, and we are going to be right back. Don't go away. back. This is Corner Office and I'm Susan Radojevic in conversation with Deborah Pickfield, Jean Le Tourneau and David Snowden staying up late from the UK. We are trying to figure out how we can make complexity more of an opportunity and help capitalize on it. So we just broke away talking about how the government can do much better with the whole process of complexity and I want David to drill down a little bit on that because I'm really I'm, I'm actually quite it quite surprised by that because I would think that an organization would be a lot more apt and especially an entrepreneurial run organization so David how can you drill down a little bit about your your experience with government and how they are in great how they are embracing complexity I mean, we're doing work with the Singapore government, for example, um, and have been for some time, which relates to whole of citizen engagement, measurement of population resilience. I think if you take a complexity principle, you want very finely grained objects, you want distributed cognition or large engagement, and then you can place reliance on the results. Um, similarly with other governments, and we're doing a major project in Mexico at the moment, we've done one in Pakistan, which involved mass capture. Um, of street narratives of what people are actually saying on the street corners in a quantifiable way to inform policy. Right. Now at that point you get higher level objectivity, you're dealing with the system itself rather than crazy abstractions of the system through multiple levels of management. So I think government has an ability to engage citizens, it has an ability to handle large populations and that's progressive, but companies can do the same thing. Um, and I've done work with one firm in Zurich where we can consult the whole of the workforce during a board meeting in real time in half an hour. Um, nobody actually knows what the policy issue has been discussed, they just see aspects of the policy which they comment on or tag and then the results are summarized graphically. So if we actually take the principles of a complex system which basically say you have to work with very finely grained objects, you distribute cognition, you disintermediate decision makers are you remove the mediating layers between raw data and decision making then we can start to build systems and strategy processes which actually back up complexity and I say governments have a chronic need for that because one of the big things that complexity allows you to do is to achieve far more with far less resources 
and to actually allow people to develop contextually relevant solutions in local solu in local communities within a governance framework. Mm. Now, the current theoretical constructs under which governments are doing that don't match the reality. Then that they're complicated solutions, not complex. So, if we get the theory right and the practice right, then we can make a major difference. Mm. Deborah. He's very smart. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, from a communication standpoint of view. Like yeah, I mean, I, and obviously, what what's beautiful about what you just described is the fact that it's ap appealing to a lot of people very quickly, um, and a lot of diverse opinions, which I think is very important. And unfortunately, when a lot of people are within an organization, they're going to go the party line because, again, going back to that risk, and am I going to? step out and really give an honest opinion about something when somebody's controlling my paycheck, right? Yeah. So Who wants to tell the CEO is wrong? Exactly. <laughs> and whereas I think what David, what you're saying is the fact that these people are giving an honest assessment because they're citizens of a community. So I think from that perspective, um, it is, there, there can be a powerful yeah. change, yeah. a powerful shift in, the, in that whole. I liked when you talked about the resilience a bit. Um, is that what they're trying to measure? Is the resilience, David, within, within a community? when you're talking about Singapore? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's an ability to recover from crisis, yeah? And I think that's and brilliant. I think that's very important. Yeah. It is. Yeah, I completely yeah, agree. We, we've tried to prevent failure. We need to start to live with failure yeah. and use it rather than try and prevent it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. if we, I think if we, f it's that whole, if, we, if I fail, oh my God, it's such a terrible thing. It's all, you know, it's egg on me. Yeah, that right. That kind of a deal, yeah. Does anybody in the audience have a question that they'd like to ask? And Maria, anybody from uh, our, no? Okay. Anybody? No? John, did you want to add something? Yeah, <coughs> I think uh, when David talks about engaging from a government and <coughs> governmental standpoint, uh, population, <coughs> when you work in a business and if you have a company doing strategic planning and they're uh, uh, on their, uh, you know, uh, 60th floor with a group of people working to do a competitive analysis, getting tons of people to do uh, drag da data, to do business intelligence, coming up with all kinds of projects uh, that could lead the impact to the organization and then finding out that the reception in the market is not very positive uh, because that's not what shareholders were expecting, that if they would have, the organization would have taken the time to go and talk to some of their investors to understand how they see things would lead to the same, uh, same, uh, same, uh, same, same opportunities. You know, if it, why, like I say, why play <coughs> a guessing game all the time? Mm -hmm. You know, trying to find by business analytics what you should be eating tonight when you should only ask, you know, your uh, your person next to you, what would you like to eat? You know, why should mm -hmm. I study? Uh, 2,000 uh, data to understand what people between age of this and this will eat as opposed to just ask what would you like to have for dinner. I think that organizations are getting themselves to uh, exponential uh, complexity by uh, being sold by uh, big organizations like uh, the one you mentioned earlier, David, to drive them to say we're smarter but we're not more uh, less complex. So. It's great to get those organizations smarter, but a at a high price of building complexity. Yeah. Yep. So it's an overload of data almost, yep. that we're yep. and we spend our time just analyzing. We have a question coming from the audience here. Just tell us your name. Yes, hi, Lynn Ferguson. I do like the idea of getting right to the people, hearing directly from be they consumers or citizens um, in the in Singapore case. Where does the creativity come in? Is that, are we asking those people directly for their creativity or are we taking their information and then within our own systems being creative with it and how does that all work? That's a great question. That's mm -hmm. Deborah, do you want to take that one? Yeah, well, I mean, and part of it, David would be able to speak more about what happens in Singapore, but I think it's it's a great question because it's always, what did um, Henry Ford say? If I had to build a car, or if I asked people what they wanted, they'd say, just give me a better, stronger horse. Um, <laughs> so how do we get that creativity to come out when people are without a process to it that enables that to happen? And so I, I don't know, David, could you talk about that? Did, was there some focus and, on creativity? And, and what's the difference, I'm sorry, what's the difference between creativity and innovation? David? <laughs> you want me to be more controversial? <laughs> <laughs> creativity has got both all to do with innovation. <laughs> <laughs> the 
creativity is a symptom of innovation, not a cause of innovation. So innovative people happen to be creative. Running creativity, co I mean, I've, I've done a lot of work on battlefield knowledge management. All right, I've seen a huge amount of creativity in the battlefield. Okay. I've yet to see anybody don different coloured hats in the process of engaging with the enemy. Right? <laughs> um, preconditions for innovation are starvation, pressure, and perspective shift, and they always have been. Um, on the mass engagement issue, I think th is, there's a good illustration of this. The Obama White House got it completely wrong when he came on board on how do you do mass engagement. So they spent a huge amount of money setting up a website where people could propose initiatives. And so loads of people proposed initiatives, and then they had too many, so what the hell did they do? So they spent another couple of you know, million actually creating a polling system to vote on it. Mm -hmm. And now they're sitting there wondering which interest groups they don't want to vote for Obama at the next election, or are going to get pissed off that their initiative didn't come. That's the wrong level of granularity. Okay. The work we do is we get the stories that people about their day-to-day -day life, yeah? what they're actually doing, what they hope, not specific proposals for change. Yeah? We then build good theory into the index structure so that the patterns that emerge from the way people index those stories can then be used by policymakers to start to run the initiatives which will respond to real needs. Um, there's quite a few people, including the next Democratic Party national chairman, who actually think this sort of stuff will replace polling and focus groups. Yeah, because they're too explicit, they're too structured, they're too open to lobby groups. You want to get below that to what anthropologists call the ideation culture. Yeah, the way we do things around here that we all understand but we can't articulate. And if you can start to map those cultural needs at that level, then you can start to produce policy initiatives. There's then a whole body of other complexity methods like social network stimulator, which basically allow communities who prove they can use resources to get more resources without having to fill in forms or go through processes to get the money. Yeah, I success-based criteria. So there's a whole body of method developed in this field, but you've got to get the granularity right, and it mustn't be what do you want us to do because then you're just into conventional politics, and we all know where that leads. And I continue from a European perspective to express deep sympathy to all of my US friends for their current political situation. We look forward to you to having a democracy, not a market at some stage in the future. <laughs> okay, how okay. do we follow that? <laughs> all right. Well, David, can I, can I add to that? But my, my question would be, I mean, I, I do think creativity can come into problem solving. I mean, how we approach, our, you know, you're on to much bigger things than most organizations are, but any small team of individuals have a challenge in how they approach a problem that's just confronted, because as we all know, people are putting out fires all the time. So I do think there's creativity that can come in there about how they approach things. That's my two cents. I don't completely, dis I don't completely agree that creativity isn't a huge input to innovation. She, she was deliberately provoking me there. She <laughs> <laughs> Who, me? No. <laughs> Jean? Yeah, a little you. <laughs> <laughs> Jean, do you want to no. take a stab here? I, I, I think uh, innovation is, uh, is easier to do than creativity. You cannot expect everyone to be uh, creative, but I could agree with you that uh, you could you could get creati creativity when you l the least expect it. Mm -hmm. And you should never forget that uh, if you work in a business environment and you expect uh, the only the top floor to know what's going on, sometimes the people that uh, work in the shipping and receiving may have a lot of answers to uh, the issues that are happening at the top. So, you know, creativity is coming sometimes from where you cannot expect mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. You know, innovation is different. It's something that you can learn to do, probably much easier, but creativity, it's harder to call for. Yeah. We, we're, we've got a great conversation going here, and we are about probably three or four minutes from ending the show, but I think we're going to stay on a, an extra five minutes and continue the conversation because I want to tap into the audience um, virtually. Maria? What are we hearing out there? Are they just? Everyone is, I think, intent on listening. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, I want to continue this conversation because David is really um, challenging us to think differently, which is, all, which is what complexity is. It's about, how do you say it, David? You say that complexity is about thinking differently about the world, not applying a different thought to an existing method. Is that correct? Is that, did I understand that to be 
in that way, in a simple form. So it's, it's about thinking about things differently about the world. Uh, Go ahead, say I, if I'm wrong. I was talking wrong. more about some of the other projects. I, I, I hardly heard that. You'll have to repeat Okay. It. Is complexity about thinking differently about the way we look at the world? It's all, yes, and it's actually it's thinking differently about how we look at the world, but principally it's thinking differently about how we act in the world. You don't have to act in the world to look at it if it's complex. Okay. So we talked about, so, so we, some of us, understand the, the concept. And most people, actually most people do tend to understand the concepts. How do we take the concept, and I know David you gave some great government um, initiatives that you're working on right now, but for our audience who's primarily corporate, how do we take the concept of what complexity presents as an opportunity or even as a, as a challenge and then apply some real concrete things to it that we can actually do. How do, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we move that? It, it's, no real, uh, it's not really different. Let me give you two examples, all right? I mean, I mentioned a Zero firm that's private sector where we're doing whole of workforce consultation during a board meeting, all right? Uh, that's engagement of the workforce in complex decision making because the danger is, you know, executives are pattern in trained. They see the world a certain way. And in a complex system, that's where you get what are called low probability, high impact events, which come to that field and kill them, right? And you can't train a leader not to do that. That's just part of being human. So you need to increase the number of human sensors in the network if the situation is complex, so you spot things faster. So whole of workforce engagement and creating systems which technology now allows us to do that is, is cool. It's the same on markets. And they've got one system where people who consume a product, yeah, every hundredth person in one of 250 sample stores around the states basically goes into a booth and tells a story about their product which they index and the marketing director has got a three-dimensional landscape on their screen in which the hollows represent the brand and they can click on the hollows and read the stories or listen to the stories told by their consumers so complexity gives us a whole body of methods yeah and it's finely grained objects distributed cognition disintermediation those are the basic rules and it doesn't matter whether you're government or whether you're industry or whether you're a small community center trying to be a community activist around AIDS awareness or something, the same principles apply. Okay. Deborah? So you're asking how can we help influence or make a change? Is how that do what you make a change? How do we go how do we take the concept of complexity and actually do something physically with it? Make okay. it make that. So the first thing I would do is is within any organization, it's it, it work on the listening skills. To really sit back and actually absorb what somebody is saying to try and really understand where they're coming from. So with, whether it's within your team, whether it's within your clients, your, your customers, your suppliers, and until you take that time to really understand, you have, you're looking at it from your own framework. So that's where I would start. And, and then it's when you're working on those listening skills is helping people learn how to engage in a way that's not judging, it's not being critical of it, and it's actually being open to what is coming forward. It doesn't mean that it's going to go forward, but you've got to be open to it. And can I share my one story that we uh, yeah, I was sharing some of the other day? One of there's things that we do subtly within the workplace, and a friend was telling me a story where um, these executives were all sitting around a table, and this facilitator finally called them on something and said, "Why is it when this one person speaks?" you all sit back and you push away from the table. So the body language and the actual language was, we're not listening. We're not checking in with what you're talking about. And the facilitator called them on it and they realized they weren't truly engaged with this person who was one of their senior executives. We do that all the time. Check out when somebody's talking. So how do we start saying, I may not like this person, but I've got to listen to what they have to say and learn from it. So. Okay, well let me ask you this. How do you, and I don't want to sound mean here, but how do you stop those whining voices that really don't contribute to the conversation, but they just want to hear, have themselves he heard? Right. Well, so part of that is naming it in a, in a respectful way, but you just you have to you have to acknowledge it. You have to say, you know, you, a, you've only got a little bit of time, but you find a way to um, say this is how we're going to communicate something. And if somebody's using that choice to just oh woe is me and not be accountable. And the book I was talking to you about the other day, Conscious Business by Fred Kaufman, talks exactly through the language of how you handle those kind of different 
complexities all the time. And again, if we're not, if, if two thirds of our, of our productivity comes from how we engage with each other, we better learn how to work together really effectively. Well, we don't sometimes, <coughs> I don't think we, we can't work together or engage with each other in simple and complicated environments to, to use David's uh, Kinevin framework. Right. I think we make those environments complex and now we are in a complex environment. Um, Jean, what, how, do we, how do we move? How do we move from concept to, to application? I think uh, <coughs> the first step is to get uh, CEOs to understand uh, uh, the context they are in. You know, first they have to realize that they are not in a simple environment anymore. They are in a complex environment. As per David's uh, article, if you don't understand where you are, and I know uh, David has been talking a few times about Six Sigma, it's like, you know, Six Sigma does not kill a company, it's the people who are using it in a, in a wrong way that are killing it. So when you have CEOs using a wrong style at the wrong point in time, it means it's uh, contaminating the organization. So if you want an organization to deal with complexity, it has to be recognized as a complex organization at the top and not uh, put your head in the sand. So they have to be open to that. And then the first step, I guess, when you talk about constraint, uh, first constraint that you need to deal with is you need engaging, engaging your people, engaging all your stakeholders, whether it's your citizen, if you're a country, if you're a company, it's your shareholders, it's your suppliers, it's your customers, it's your employees. You need to get everyone starting to work together. But unless that it comes from the top, and the top is willing to do that, it's just uh, a good wish. Okay, this is the final question, and I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds, because what I'm hearing here is that we have to think about um, the compl complexities about thinking differently about what we're doing and how we're acting in, in the world that we're living in, and we need to embrace and be more interactive and hear people. So 30 seconds, what is the one thing that you would recommend to our in-house audience and our online community that they can, right after this show, go and start doing? David? They need to understand the theory, so they're going to have to actually do some reading and or book training or whatever. They can't avoid that. But if they want to do something straight away, find a current difficult or intractable problem get five groups of people who have different contradictory solutions and get them to devise safe to fail experiments which cost you very little money and see what happens when you run them. Deborah? Okay. Um, be in a meeting and I would love to see a minute of silence after each person speaks where you actually are thinking about what that person has said and actually making notes about it so you're not so quickly thinking, oh, but I've got to tell you this, right? And give you my two cents and tell you what I'm thinking because you're not really listening. Sean? I would say, uh, <coughs> and it's funny, it's going to uh, kind of build on something that you just sent me. It's uh, getting organizations to start to move slower, to move mm -hmm. faster. Because when you try to go too quick, you don't have time to think. You don't have time to understand if you are in a complex or a simple environment. You are not making the difference and you're taking actions that will lead to chaos. So unless you can start to move slower, to move quicker, you're, you're not in business. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. Well, there you have it, folks. Assemble five teams. Find a problem in your organization. Assemble five teams. Listen to what they have to say. For a whole minute. A whole minute. <laughs> and slow down before you can go fast. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, David, Deborah, and Jean for sharing your wisdom in Corner Office today. Corner Office Episode 7, How to Make Complexity Work for You is locked in. Our complexity series continues next month. Don't forget to bookmark our agency blog to read about future show dates and guests. If you would like to watch this episode again, it is being recorded and will be available for viewing next week on our webpage, Corner Office Episodes. Our website is theperegrineagency.ca. If you have thoughts on today's show or want to share your opinion about what David said, <laughs> go to our website and click on the agency blog and post your comments. Find us on Twitter, our hashtag is CEOLive, or follow me at Susan Radojevic. If your organization has an innovative method, resource, tool, or technology, 
our community should know about, go to our website and click on Contact Us. Thank you, Maria, and a big shout out to our sponsors and partners coming up on your screen. They make the show possible. So check them out. And finally, thanks very much for our online community and in-house audience for joining us today and sharing your wisdom. And we hope to see you next month in Corner Office. I'm Susan Radojevic, logging out. The future of meetings and events as a business builder and leadership intervention tool is not about going just to talk, it's actually going to do something. Dealing with corner office, one thing that where I thought was found huge value and this was the preparatory work. Getting people to, uh, to trust and uh, well, I call it going deeper with them because if, unless you can get them to go deep, you don't get out what they're really thinking and you don't get out the really good ideas and you don't get out the, the, the whole purpose for, for having the collaboration. Having the, the live people here and the online and, and having the both, both brought in, I really like that as opposed to just having online or just having live. And uh, they actually walked us through a whole process and asked us some tough questions. If you're going to be put in front of a camera and they ask you, you know, why do you exist, I thought that was just a stroke of brilliance. An, an idea for them to take away, like some of this, take some of this brilliant conversation and this is how you might consider beginning to apply it slowly into mm -hmm. what you do in your daily life in one small thing to get them to start shifting. This arrangement was very conducive. 